Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you all this morning. If you're not familiar with who I am, uh, my name is Jim Osland. I serve as a both campus pastor and, as of January 1, directional pastor alongside Pastor Eric uh, in the new co-leadership model. So it's great to be here with you and to spend the morning here. I uh, hope to get many more chances to do this uh, at different points in time along the way. Uh, but Eric this morning is up in McPherson. We swapped today, so it's good for us to come and connect with different people, spend the morning with you. We are in this series called Journey Through Acts, and, and really it's it's kind of meant to be a journey through this entire year as we work our way through the book of Acts. I was talking with somebody earlier between second and third service, and they're like, i just loving this. Uh, are we ever going to get tired of it? I was like, I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of twists and turns and jailbreaks and shipwrecks and all kinds of fun stuff yet to come. So hang in there. I think you're really going to learn a lot through this series and uh, find a lot of joy in uh, following Jesus through this time of our life together. Uh, but it's quite different today than it was the first time I taught seven and a half years ago here on this same spot. Uh, I was asked to teach Revelation 13, 14, and 15, I think. I had three chapters of Revelation. I don't know who thought that up. Probably the teaching pastor, but anyway, no. It's, uh, today I just get 15 verses of Acts. So I'm really excited to unpack that with you all today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 3 verses 11 through 26. We're going to read that here together in just a moment. But you're going to see that there's a pattern that starts to emerge here beginning of of, uh, Acts chapter 3, uh, and it continues much through the rest of the book, where there is kind of three parts to it. There's a miraculous event that takes place. Something amazing happens, uh, and people's eyes are kind of open to the, the kingdom of God breaking in. And then there's this presentation of the gospel, There's this opportunity for one of the disciples to really kind of open up and share about Jesus in a significant way. And then there's usually the third part, which next week you'll hear about in this sequence from Eric uh, in Acts chapter 4, is kind of this opposition that comes from the religious authorities. And and this pattern kind of continues, as you'll see as we continue teaching through this. So today we're going to look at the presentation of the gospel. We're kind of in the middle, the sandwich of this pattern, if you will. Uh, And uh, I hope that you find this to be life-giving for you. So we're going to read together uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 11 through 26. It's 995 in the Bibles in your seats if you want to follow along there, or it's on the screen behind me. Here's what it says, the word of the Lord. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Messiah would suffer Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who he has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God would raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. And you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Last Sunday, Eric would have talked to you about truth 
and power. And I love the wording he used in this, and I, I want to pick back up on that, because the early church had a truth that couldn't be dismissed and a power that couldn't be denied. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, we see this power, right, on display. They didn't have silver or gold, but what we have, we give to you. Be healed in the name of Jesus. And, of course, this was an amazing experience. And, and this man who had been excluded from the temple for many, many years, who had to lay outside the gate called Beautiful, he didn't get confused. He knew exactly who to praise in that moment. He praised God. He didn't praise the disciples for their power. He knew what was up. And yet a crowd of people inside the temple began to flock. And they had all these questions about what this was like. It was like a mob at a red carpet event surrounding Peter and John. They were filled with wonder and amazement, it says. And Peter had to share the truth. So you have power coupled with truth. Now, Peter, in his presentation of the gospel, he gives them some bad news and some good news. Now, usually when we have this kind of thing, we ask, which one do you want first, right? You want the bad news? You want the good news? Well, in Peter's presentation of the gospel, he brings the two together. And I think it's really helpful for us to remember this, to put the good and the bad news together of the gospel so that people can experience it completely. So after God healed this lame beggar in the beautiful gate, Peter and John were used in this amazing way, right? He went walking and leaping and praising God. That's an old Sunday school song. Maybe some of you know it, right? Uh, amazing to see someone who had been laying there for so long have a miraculous turn of events. People, they flock to Solomon's colonnade, sometimes called Solomon's porch. And this is kind of an artist rendering of what we think it might have looked like. Two rows of long columns uh, on the east side of the temple where the people would have gathered at different points in time. Uh, and, and the significance of this place would have been important to the disciples because it was a place that Jesus walked and taught. Uh, in John chapter 10, if you're familiar with that part of the gospel, uh, it's where Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd. And he talks about the abundant life that he comes to offer, right? And at the end of that, he makes an, a, a, a kind of a claim to be one with God. And at that, the Pharisees, what they do? They start to pick up stones. They're ready to stone him right here at Solomon's porch, Solomon's colonnade, because Jesus was, in their mind, claiming to be God. He was blasphemy, which was punishable by death. So in this very place, on the same porch, proclaiming almost a very similar kind of thing about who Jesus is, here's Peter and John, these two disciples. And they say all these kind of cluster of significant titles for who Jesus is, right? The righteous and holy one, the, the, the Messiah. They use all these different terms for who he is, basically saying he is God. And then he says, they say this when the crowd asks, this is, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if it's by our power or our godliness that this man was made to walk? Jesus told you who he was, but you didn't accept it. You disowned him, and you handed him over to Pilate to be killed. Ouch. Right? Bad news for these people gathered at Solomon's colonnade. You just participated in this experience where the author of life is killed. You killed the author of life, verse 15. But then he couples this with good news, right? Immediately after that. But God raised him from the dead. You killed him, God raised him. Bad news, good news. They come together. You see, it's very likely that some of these same eyewitnesses to the experience of this lame beggar getting up and walking and leaping and praising God were the same people who were in the crowd crying, crucify him a few months earlier. Could have been the same people. We don't know. But the irony is not lost on Peter. He's very aware of these situations. He lived it. He walked through these situations with Jesus. And here he is in the same place where they almost killed him once, claiming these powerful truths. Verse 19 is this invitation. The good news to these people is to repent, to turn to God so that their sins would be wiped away and refreshment could come from the Lord. This is conversion in the New Testament. This is what it looks like to change one's mind and to turn, to reorient yourself, to put your life around Jesus, to center yourself on Jesus and the cross. 
Now, perhaps you've noticed as I've read these words and as I've talked a little bit already that the good news that Peter shares here in Acts chapter 3 is a little different than oftentimes what the good news is presented as in the church throughout the history. You see, there's no hint in any of what Peter says that God killed Jesus. It's not there. Yet there is a theory about this gospel that says that God was the one who killed Jesus, that God needed Jesus to die, that God needed his blood to be shed, that God needed an ultimate sacrifice so that he could forgive our sins. Yes, the gospel has some bad news in it, but this kind of a theory actually makes the bad news about God rather than our human condition. So if this is the case, then Jesus' death was actually meant to change God rather than us. But who really needs to be transformed? Who really needs to be changed? Who needs to be reoriented? Is it God? No. It's us. It's our human tendency to turn away from God. So this theory that, that we often have used and to present the gospel to people for hundreds of years is really honestly inconsistent with the way the first gospel is presented in Acts 2 and Acts 3. Where Peter teaches, God gave Jesus as a gift. You disowned him and you murdered him. So wait, who killed Jesus? Go back and look at verse 13 through 15 with me. You look back at these verses, you're going to see it four different times, right? Verse 13, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. Verse 14, you disowned the holy righteous one. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. Who is you? Who are they referring to? Does it mean the Jews? Does it mean the Romans who actually nailed him to the cross? Was he talking to the other disciples? I mean, Jesus was betrayed and denied. Peter was the one who denied him three times even. No, I think the cross is revealing something about the darkness of of the human heart, the human condition, that is, we could say this you is really all y'all, right? All people. We put him on the cross. Our turning away from God, our tendency to go our own way, is why Jesus went to the cross. And God didn't force it. Jesus willingly laid down his life out of love. He wanted to offer his life. So the cross can teach us three things. If you want to write something down, this is maybe something good to, to, to write down for yourself to think through the rest of the week. First, it exposes the ugliness of human sin. That's bad news, folks, right? We all have it. It lives within us. We, we continue to fight those human tendencies to want to go the, the way of, of, of sin. Second, the cross reveals to us the love of God. That is good news. That God so loved the world, sent Jesus. Jesus willingly loves all of us, his friends, lays down his life for us. And third, it opens up the path to forgiveness and healing. That, my friends, is great news. Great news. Peter's making some pretty bold statements here in this passage, right? He's preaching really for the second time as far as we can tell, but he's up there giving kind of a comprehensive testimony to who Jesus is, and that aroused some antagonism and some anger from the Jewish authorities. We'll see more of that next week when Eric's back to teach on Acts 4. But he says stuff like, you killed the author of life. That's striking, right? They participated in this, as we all did. But the authorities, they sure didn't like it. It's a striking oxymoron, right? The giver of life is now deprived life. The one who gave it to us to begin with has now had it taken away. Then he says stuff like this in verse 17, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, you know. There's a little of this kind of tongue-in-cheek maybe going on that I get that you kind of went the way that, the, that everybody else was, was telling you to go. They formed this mob, and they all cried out, you participated in it. But then he says this, but God, God knew what he was doing. You didn't kind of throw God's plan off in some way because of your inability to see who Jesus really was. He connects the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus to the grand history, the grand story of 
the Jewish people. Verse 22 through 26, right? He pulls in Moses and Samuel and Abraham, and he declares these promises that God has given to them and that they were to be a blessing. He didn't deprive all those things from him. He didn't change all that. He just said, this is how it's going to happen, through Jesus. He's pointing them to the truth and to the power. Now, next week, like I said, you'll, you'll get more into this boldness of the disciples and what happens. But it's one of the biggest pieces of evidence we have to the truth of the resurrection. When you think about it, where were these guys a few months earlier? Behind closed, locked doors, hiding in fear for their life because they thought they might have been next. Right? They denied him, betrayed him, and they're, they're just holed up here trying to wait it out. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit given to them, they suddenly begin to preach the gospel boldly and they stand up to the Sanhedrin saying, we can't keep quiet about the things that we have seen and heard. Pretty striking, the boldness that we see here from these disciples. Now, Mennonites have typically not been known to be so bold, all right? Uh, maybe that is your experience with it. Maybe you don't have as much experience with that idea, but the, our, our spiritual ancestors were actually called the quiet in the land. Now, some of that was kind of in a withdrawal posture because of some of the persecution that was going on, but sometimes it became kind of uh, insulation where we could just say, my life speaks for itself. You know, I, I'm going I'm to live the gospel. I'll just, you'll just see it in me. That's why I often say, what, who do you think Mennonite's favorite Catholic saint is? I know Mennonite's Catholic saint, yeah. Who do you think? St. Francis of Assisi, right? We love this. Yep, see, I saw uh, Wiesner's over here got it. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi, right? Uh, what's, what's his quote? Preach the gospel at all times, finish it. If necessary, use words, right? Well, here, I hate to burst his bubble. Words are necessary, right? It, it is. It's necessary. We need to be able to have integrity that our life definitely is congruent with our words, but we can't just live and not have words. They have to go together. Jesus commissioned us to do this very thing, right? He said, go into all the world, teach or preach the gospel, right? To baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That requires words. Peter, he's using lots of words, many other words, right? Eric sometimes likes to use that when his sermons go long. <laughs> many other words, right? Um, but uh, then we see it in Paul, too. Paul says this in Romans 10, verse 14 and 15, and I, I think this is important words for us today. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. The good news must be shared with the sent people of God going forth. That's you and me. This is the basis of what we call in the church evangelism. The English word derived from the Greek word that we see 77 times in the New Testament. The word here is euangelion. It's a compound word that has two different things that are put together. You is good, and gelion is announcement. So the good announcement is often kind of... a translated in our Bibles as the gospel or as the good news. So what can we learn from these spirit-filled followers of Jesus, the early church, about putting words to the gospel? Remember, they had a truth that couldn't be dismissed and a power that couldn't be denied. They had these two elements that helped them. That truth and power is available to us as well. And it was evident that day at Solomon's Colonnade, right? When the lame beggar began to leap for joy, praise God, Peter, he shares a very simple gospel. First thing he does is he makes sure that all the credit is going to Jesus for what just took place. He doesn't want any of the credit. He's pointing them to the fact that this name, this faith in this name, that this man was made whole. They didn't have the power themselves, but the very name of Jesus, God used them to heal the lame beggar. You know, there's so many songs that we sing about the name of Jesus. We did sang a couple already, right? First service folks, I was able to, to sing a couple of these for them too, right? 
All hail the power of Jesus' name. We might have sing, this might have been a little, little earlier in days, but we don't sing it as much, but Jesus, name above all names. Or how about, what a beautiful name it is. There is power in the name of Jesus, right? This name has power throughout the generations. And we sing of that name because we know of its power. These people of Israel, they were witnesses of this incredible miracle that happened in the name of Jesus. And of course, like they, they wanted to know more. What are we supposed to do? Right? This is their response after they hear that this is what happened. And then Peter presents this very simple gospel. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing will come from the Lord. It's a simple gospel. It's not that complicated, right? Repent and turn to God. You know, we've taught a number of times over the past few years about our desire at Journey to be what we call a Jesus-centered church. We've illustrated the differences between bounded, fuzzy, and centered churches. You've seen Eric probably either draw, poorly draw these experiences, or put them on the screen. But it's hopefully something that's familiar to you. I want to draw a connection to this, to something that I think is quite different between these groups that, that oftentimes we might just gloss over, and that's the idea of conversion. You see, in the fuzzy church, transformation, conversion isn't really talked about that much, if I'm honest. At the risk of being kind of oversimplifying this, it's, it's pretty much wide open in a fuzzy church to you believe what you want to believe and you live your way the way you want to live it. And that we, we all just kind of share in this community together. And it's, and it's good, but it's not very focused. Unless you're being converted from a bounded church, right? Then there's all these things you have to get rid of, throw off, let go of. And in a bounded church, there are two positions. There are outsiders and there are insiders. And in this way, conversion is crossing the line of faith becoming an insider, where the lost becomes found, and oftentimes that happens, happened in my life when I was a young man, was to pray a sinner's prayer, to simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need you uh, to trust in the cross and the power of the cross to forgive me so that I could have eternal life and be with you in heaven. Maybe you prayed a prayer very similar to that. It's oftentimes a great starting point to put yourself before the Lord. The conversion is in this idea is to be saved. And to be saved means you will go to heaven when you die. So you need life insurance in this life, but then you need afterlife insurance for uh, this kind of a perspective of, of praying a prayer like that. That's, that's how I was raised. That's how many of you might have experienced it as well. It might sound right to you even today. But the problem is Jesus never talked like this. He never went up on the mountainside with a bunch of people and had them sit down and then say, all right, folks, here's the minimum entrance requirements for heaven. I'll tell you what you need to do. He never did that. Instead, what he did is he went and he told them things like, you must take up your cross daily if you want to follow me. Right? Instead of Jesus giving them all the things they needed to know about heaven when they die, instead he, he talked more about what they should do to bring more of heaven to earth while they live. Which is why journey, we believe there is a better, more biblical way to understand conversion. It comes from the Latin word converse. I'm not talking about the canvas shoe company, right? I'm talking rather instead about turn about, to change, right? To turn about. So in a centered church, conversion isn't about crossing some line of faith. It's rather about aligning ourselves with the cross. In this kind of a way, moving toward the center, moving toward Jesus, our trajectory is more important than our station. Right? The way in which we're going to choose to follow Jesus is what matters. Now see, this equates quite well to the Old Testament perspective of what happened with the Jews long ago, Right? The Old Testament, if you read through the Old Testament, it's kind of a roller coaster ride with God, right? So there's, there, there are times where they're like, woo, we're really close to God, and there's other times like, 
curse God, right? Let's, uh, let's turn away. Let's go back to Egypt. At least we'd have meat to eat. You know, there's things they do back and forth like this all along their journey. And the prophets, they, they pick up on this. And they talk about the ways in which the, the people have turned away from God. Mishuvah is the, the Hebrew word, to turn away from. But they call them continuously to turn back, to shuv to the Lord, to turn back to God. Here in Acts chapter 3, that's what Peter's doing. He's saying, you disowned him on the same porch, right? You about stoned him then, and then you called for his crucifixion later. But you can turn back. You can return to the Lord, and you will experience your sins being wiped away and refreshment. You see, when we do that together as a community of faith, when we turn our lives toward the cross and we begin to move together, we become this interconnected web of people who are centered around the cross. Now, some people, they, they do an immediate about face, right? They, they notice something's incongruent with their faith. Somebody presents the gospel to them and boom, they're right back to the cross and they're wanting to move as close and as fast as they can. Those kind of testimonies are powerful, right? I've cried tears into baptism tanks and helped baptize people with my tears after hearing stories like that. And I'm sure you have too in situations like that where you just moved. Reality is many of us don't have a story like that. Many of us feel ashamed of our story because it isn't that powerful. Nobody gets a kind of a wow factor out of what we have to say about our lives. Our conversion maybe wasn't fast. It wasn't dramatic. It might have been a slow turn like an ocean liner, right? It might have been growing up in a Christian home where I learned these things and I gradually became to know who Jesus was and I started to turn my life toward him. And now I'm pointed in the right direction. I don't know your story. We need all of them. But the reality is if there's one thing we can learn from Peter's simple presentation of the gospel, this is a fisherman, hard, rough hand, blue-collar kind of guy. And the presentation that he gives, this euangelion, this gospel is not centered on the healed beggar. He doesn't talk about how amazing this, this experience is and how this beggar was, was the one that God wanted to bless and do this amazing thing through. He doesn't put the attention on himself or on John. It's not about their boldness or their power or their abilities, right? Instead, he fixes and centers the entire experience on the crucified, risen Christ. You see, miraculous transformation, it'll draw a crowd every time. People will want to know and come see, and some will want to poke holes in what happened, but people will come if something miraculous happens. But armed with a simple gospel, that crowd can be moved to turn their life to the cross. You see, what I want you to know today is that every one of you has a powerful testimony doesn't matter what the circumstances were in your life because the testimony is centered on Jesus. We all have access to it. You know, a few years ago, I was introduced to something called the Gospel in 30 Words. It's something that was developed by a pastor named Bruxy Cavey at the Meeting House in Canada, and it's been something that has kind of stuck with me and resonated in many different ways. It's allowed me to kind of take this simple gospel message, internalize it, and be able to share it with people whenever the Spirit prompts me to do so. Uh, and I encourage you to, to learn it. It can be a really helpful, powerful tool for you as well. But it talks about four things that Jesus came to do. They're highlighted in these four colored boxes. One, to show us God's love. Two, save us from sin. Three, set up his kingdom. And four, shut down religion. These four things present a really beautiful, full gospel, right? Amazing things that Jesus came to do and show us so that we could have life with God. But here's the thing, just one of them can be the turning point for someone. It can be the point in time where they begin to see the cross and want to turn back to it. Here's what I'm talking about. I'll illustrate this just in ways in which I've seen this work. First, folks who come from a broken family. Somebody who feels abandoned, feels alone, feels lost in this world. Right? For them to hear of God's love and to know it through the church and to be a part of the church family can point them toward the cross in a beautiful way. That's maybe all they need to get them started. Second, for those who maybe are battling sin or feel ashamed of all that they've done in their past and don't even feel like they could even go to a church because of what they've done. No one would accept them. 
For them to hear that there is a rescuer who can save them from their sin, who can blot that out, wipe it away, and make them whole again, it might be all they need to turn their life toward God. For those who have experienced poverty, powerlessness, who have been oppressed, who feel weighted down by the injustice of this world, maybe it's things that have happened to them from outside sources, things that people have done to them to hurt them, right? To experience that in the government even. For people to know that they are welcomed into a new kind of kingdom and they can be a full citizen in that kingdom can be incredibly powerful for them. Or for those who've been wounded from religiosity, those who've been grown up in a, in a system that was hell-bent on rules and boundaries and just heavy oppression in the churches, for them to throw that off and to be set free, to know that the light and easy yoke of Jesus is there for them, can be powerful. So yes, use all four, but sometimes listening and learning to know someone can help you to know how to share the gospel with them in a way that will help them turn about. You know, when we're putting together messages as a teaching team, we sometimes ask these three things. What do we want people to know? What do we want them to feel? What do we want them to do? I want to give you a quick recap of those three things from today. First, what I want you to know, the gospel is simple. The gospel is simple. It's available to all of us to share because it's about Jesus. It's not about your own story, right? You can connect your elements of the story, but the most important thing for people to know is Jesus crucified and risen. Second, what I want you to feel, I want you to feel irrelevant today (laughs) and empowered. That your story and the details of it are actually not as important as lots of people have made it out to be. Your story is important. It's powerful, can be, depending upon how you use it. But more important is that you have the power of the name of Jesus and that you can use that power to testify to him, to offer healing to others, to experience what God's power and truth come together. Third, what I want you to do, first, foremost, to all of us, I want you to repent and to turn to God. If you've never done that before, if you've done it many times before, Maybe today you need to do it again. If there's things that are separating you from God, if there's sin that is holding you back, to just turn that over to the Lord. Repent, to turn back to the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I want life with you. I want that abundant life that you almost got killed for talking about and the life that you showed us on the cross. Second, I want you to speak boldly. I want you to know that that incredible, simple gospel has power. Memorize these go- this gospel in 30 words. It's a great tool that you can take with you. You can share with anybody. If you teach it to somebody, you'll know it forever. But to use that as a tool to share the gospel with others can be so powerful. Last, never forget that the UN Galeon, the gospel, the good news, is not centered on you and me. It is centered on the crucified, risen Christ. Is he Lord and King of your life? I pray he is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the powerful uh, witness, example of these first apostles, the early church, the ways in which they were filled with your spirit and they acted boldly and people were added to their number daily. Lord, we want to see that in our church, in all three of our campuses, in all of our lives in our families in our neighborhoods lord and so i pray that you would empower us with that same spirit with the boldness of peter to go and to share the good news that jesus you are the lord of heaven of earth you're the king of our hearts the king of our lives we praise you we love you 